my book is The Border Between Them, Violence and Reconciliation on the Kansas-Missouri Line. And the story of the book is the story of a, 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 an invisible line across the prairie landscape, which is the Kansas-Missouri border, and its creation and its contested meanings during the Civil War era, and then the difficulty of the people along that line to move on with their lives in the late 19th century. This was such a violent place from the beginning that you have the violent dispossession of group after group beginning with the Osage Indians, uh, continuing through the Mormons uh, who had moved to western Missouri under Joseph Smith, and then through the Civil War era you have uh, the struggle over freedom and the, the question of whether Kansas territory would be open for slavery or would be free soil. And so the violence of the 1850s is really about that question, um, but it becomes wrapped in so much more. You have fights typical to other frontier locations over water and access to, to grazing lands, but magnified uh, incredibly because of the tensions over slavery. At Bleeding Kansas is this fight between a pro-slavery faction that wants to make Kansas a, a slave territory and a slave state, and the free state faction that wants to uh, prohibit slavery from spreading into Kansas. And initially the pro-slavery faction has the upper hand. Uh, it's mostly Missouri settlers moving into Kansas to elect pro-slavery representatives, to write a pro-slavery constitution, and to petition to the Senate for approval as a slave state. Um, but quickly, the pro-slavery faction, which is centered in Lecompton, and so you hear references to the Lecompton Constitution, they overplay their hand. Um, the early elections are marred by fraud. Uh, they pass a constitution that uh, denies basic civil rights to anyone critical of slavery. Uh, they impose severe penalties for anyone, not just assisting runaway slaves, but expressing any kind of public criticism of the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850. And so in the popular consciousness in the North, um, you begin to have this sense that the Lecompton government, the pro-slavery government in Kansas, is really under a cloud of illegitimacy. Um, and what will change in the midst of Bleeding Kansas is a rising tide of settlers or migrants from the North. And so initially you have a pro-slavery majority of people living in Kansas territory. But by 1857 and 1858, you now have a free soil majority. And so it's a remarkable time during which most of America is looking at Kansas and the struggle there as a, a struggle for the fate of the West and by extension a struggle over the fate of America in the rest of the 19th century. And so it's, it's a race to send the most people into Kansas territory. And with uh, pro-slavery partisans and free soilers moving side by side, uh, the political struggle, this ideological struggle, very quickly turns violent. Guerrilla warfare is irregular violence carried out by ordinary men, usually. Uh, it's not violence waged by regular soldiers, professionals, or even volunteer militia, but, but men who take violence into their own hands, and, and they frequently meet this violence out um, against their partisan enemies. Uh, and so Bleeding Kansas becomes marked by arson and plunder and murder, and, and it rages for many, many months as the political fate of Kansas territory hangs in the balance. Uh, the person who's most singularly associated with this in Kansas is John Brown after the Pottawatomie Massacre. Uh, in 1858, John Brown, he, having left Kansas, comes back to the territory and he begins a series of um, raids into western Missouri uh, during which his men will uh, liberate uh, enslaved people from Missouri and help them escape to freedom. Uh, in the course of this, they'll kill uh, a number of slaveholders. And so the, the legend or the notoriety of John Brown really grows as part of this um, struggle that people locally understand is really the beginning of the Civil War. Most Americans think about the Civil War starting at Fort Sumter in South Carolina in April 1861, but along the Kansas-Missouri line, people will often look to 1856 and John Brown and see the start of the Civil War. What happens along the border is that you can see many of the patterns of the larger Civil War coming to the West, this part of America, sooner. Um, you have the war against slavery being waged pretty aggressively uh, into Western Missouri 
under Jayhawker militia, as they described themselves, led by James Lane, uh, this notorious and controversial Kansas senator and self-appointed general. In September 1861, Lane's Jayhawkers lead this invasion of western Missouri, and they, they ride through the countryside, burning towns, uh, liberating slaves. And in um, the culmination of this attack, they burn this, the small village of Osceola, which was believed to be the arsenal of local Confederates. And to Lane's men, this was just retribution for treason or secession. And by the time that Lane's men return to Kansas, they're now followed by hundreds of uh, formerly enslaved people who have now gained their freedom. The guerrilla violence is marked by this thirst for vengeance and, and retaliation. And so one side attacks the other, and to seek retribution, you then have Missourians crossing into Kansas. The most famous event along the Kansas-Missouri border was probably the raid by William Clark Quantrill's guerrillas, uh, who raid eastern Kansas from Missouri. Uh, and they descend upon the sleeping town of Lawrence. Lawrence, Kansas was named after an abolitionist. It was the real um, heart of anti-slavery sentiment in Kansas territory. And so it was a place that Missourians had long um, looked at as the symbol uh, of the Kansas um, threat, as they understood it, this abolitionist threat. And Quantrill's men descend upon Lawrence on the morning of August 21st. And Quantrill reportedly tells his guerrillas, who are some 400 men strong, an enormous um, size for a guerrilla band, that they were to kill any man or boy old enough to carry a gun. And by mid-morning, they've, they've slaughtered more than 170. Uh, they burn most of the town, and then they race back into Missouri and lose only one of their men uh, in the course of all of this. Uh, that they managed to do this undetected by federal uh, uh, troops or by Union militia is an outrage to Kansans. And immediately after the Lawrence Massacre, uh, you have Kansans clamoring for retribution in Missouri. And this brings the culmination of, of the guerrilla war uh, on the state line, which is August 25th when the Union Army issues Order Number 11. Uh, which is a, a military order that forcibly depopulates parts of four Missouri counties. That in order to, to end this roiling guerrilla conflict, which has been burning for years, uh, they're simply going to move everybody out. And that if the basis of support for these guerrillas is gone, then the guerrillas themselves would be gone too. And so over the course of two weeks, you have Union troops, Kansas militia, um, going farm to farm, ordering um, most of the inhabitants of these four counties uh, to get out. And it's implemented to only affect Southern sympathizers, those people who have sympathized with the Confederacy. But in its forceful application, you'll have a number of people who had described themselves as Unionists being kicked out as well. For the victims of guerrilla violence, it becomes almost impossible to move past the war. Uh, to treat these guerrillas who have burned them out of homes, uh, who destroyed the town of Lawrence. Uh, it's, it's nearly impossible to forgive uh, those kinds of offenses. Uh, for veterans, both of the Union Army and the Confederate Army and the other militias on each side, they become important agents in this larger story of national reunion and forgiveness. And it takes time. It's not until the 1880s and the 1890s that you see the people of that generation exhibiting a willingness and an ability to move on and to, to reunite, but it's a process that's uneven. These tensions over federal power and local control, uh, the, the hostility towards outsiders that, that many Missourians expressed in the, the struggle over Kansas, uh, the ways in which our politics can be distilled down into negative stereotypes of the other. Um, Missourians looked at these Kansans as imperious Yankees, uh, kind of imposing their ways. Um, Kansans and, and many Northerners looked at Missourians as backwards pukes, which was the, the term to denigrate these, what today we would describe as rednecks, uh, people who were illiterate, uncultured, uncivilized, but, but also slaveholding. Um, there, there are echoes within our own politics today that I hope don't conjure up the same turn towards violence. And I think that in the 21st century, um, perhaps there's a degree of hope 
that we can find if they can move past their own divisions that perhaps we can. Um, but the fact that we continue to um, fight over Civil War memory today um, shows us how, how durable some of these disagreements over uh, race and equality can be even in the 21st century.